Welcome, so, Terry from Reliable Process Reliable Solutions. Process Solutions. Uh, my name is Doug Wagen with UE Systems, and today's webinar is titled 100 Failure Modes of Lubricants and Lubrication Programs. I want to go ahead and introduce Terry Harris of Reliable Process Solutions, and we'll get right to the meat of this afternoon's webinar. So welcome, Terry. Thanks for being here. All right. Thank you, Doug. All right. Welcome, everybody, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, lubrication failure modes, and like Doug said, there's about a hundred uh, different failure modes we're going to talk about. We'll talk about those in groups. So uh, we'll get started here. A little bit about my company and myself. Uh, you can see some things here that I do. I'm a certified RCM facilitator. I do a number of different courses uh, for companies and teaching people how uh, to predict failures, proactive maintenance. Today you can see we're going to talk about lubrication and, and the different failure modes of lubrication. I build some plug and play lube storage rooms that are fully equipped and ready to use when they come to your facility. And you can see some other some other about my uh, uh, things we offer through the company. So the first thing I want to look at here is the is the PF curve. If we look at the curve on the right hand side where most of us uh, get our information about uh, maintenance. We can see that uh, if we work on the right side of the curve where people are telling us what's going on with our, our equipment, we're in that reactive mode and we're not going to be very effective or very efficient there when the equipment's failing uh, based on human senses. If we move to the middle of this graph, we see we have the predictive area of the curve where we have different technologies that we can use to predict failures. We can see that we can be 30 to 50 percent effective in maintenance if we know about these failures months before they happen, or we know about, you know, we can do something about them when we, as soon as we find them out in the early stage of failure. So this is the area of the curve uh, for any piece of equipment or process where you may have a failure mode that's starting, and these technologies here are going to tell us before our human senses can tell us. Now there are no order of importance uh, because we don't know what failure mode we're looking for, but you know, I can tell you from experience, uh, I started using the mechanical ultrasound equipment from UE in 1984 uh, at the plant that I operated. Uh, we used the equipment about every day and we detected a lot of failures. That was our primary predictive technology and we were very, very successful with that. If we move to the left-hand side of the curve, uh, we can see we have some things in the proactive area that will make our equipment last longer. And this is the, this is the area of the curve that we use when our equipment's running in good condition, when it's doing what it's supposed to do, but we want to maintain that. If we do some of these tasks or many of these tasks in this area, we can make our equipment last three to eight times longer, uh, longer life cycles. So you can see up here we have lubrication, uh, precision maintenance. We have uh, making sure we have select suppliers where we, so we pick out the right equipment and right components. And then on down the list, you can see there's, there's a whole training program that goes around this technology. If, if, if any of you are interested in that training for the future. So failure modes. This, the, this program is developed around reliability center maintenance. Uh, where It's an analysis process that identifies equipment components and then we look at specific failure modes of those components and we develop a maintenance strategy based around those failure modes. So if we look at a, a, a motor, for instance, a specific motor, you know, I go into a lot of plants and say why, why are the motors fail and they just say they fail, but you know they don't. They they fail for a specific reason. You know one of the one of the training sessions I do in my failure modes is the 50 failure modes of electric motors, and uh, this talks about the specific components and how each of those components can fail in that motor. And we have to know this to develop this maintenance strategy uh, to let us know what we want to keep from failing. So this RCM helps develop helps develop this our select maintenance strategy for each one of these components. So the same thing with lubricants, they don't automatically fail. Many times they fail because we help them along with the things we do in our plants. So how many failures are there for an electric motor? And, and like I said, there's over 50 failure modes for this electric motor. If we look at all the components in this motor, the bearings, if we break all those components down and then ask how he, each of these components can fail, you can see that in our processing plants, we can start eliminating the specific failure mode and make our electric motors last three to eight times longer. Very, very interesting training course. So if we understand the process of failure modes, we can develop strategies to predict the failure using our predictive technologies. We can develop strategies to prevent the failure using preventive maintenance, or we can eliminate the failures with redesign. So these are the things we, that come out of RCM, and these are the things we could do with all of our equipment and our plants. 
So as we proceed through this session, you'll see that most of these failure modes in our lubrication systems and our lubricating products can be eliminated with proper procedures. So we're first going to look at the 50 failure modes of our lubricants. And then there's another 30 to 50 failure modes of our program that we'll look at at the very end. So with lubricants, there's five major lubricant failure mode areas. We have temperature failure modes. We have moisture failure modes in the lubricant. We have foreign material or particle failure modes uh, from contaminants that get in our lubricants. We have viscosity failures, and we have some contamination issues that happen in our facilities. So let's start looking at some of these specific uh, areas. So if you look at the temperature failure mode area, what causes temperature failure mode? Well, a lot of times it's overloading of the equipment. I remember working for a large company, and every couple of years they wanted to expand the operation. We were constantly speeding up equipment. And when we did that process, we were overloading the specific components, such as the bearings and the gears, which were shortening the life. And when you do that, sometimes there need to be changes made in the viscosity or changes made in the type of lubricant to overcome the overloading. But if we're overloading, we're going to increase temperature. Overgreasing causes these high temperatures. If the equipment's located in an area where there's no air movement, we can have temperature failure modes. High viscosity oils in the wrong application can cause this over temperature. Wrong viscosity. Many of the plants I go into are using one viscosity grease for all their applications. Greases have different viscosities uh, for high speed and low speed applications. We have to make sure the viscosity of the grease is correct for the RPM or the load and speed of the application. Poor lubrication circulation is another failure mode for temperature improper or inadequate cooling. At a number of facilities I go into, we look at failure modes. We do our plant walk-arounds. The lubricants aren't being adequately cooled. And in that uh, function there, when that happens, the lubricant's going to fail at a lot earlier stage. Multi-speed, low, low, low components where we have a high-speed input gearbox and a low-speed output. You know, viscosity plays an important role in those applications, and we need to watch the temperature of those applications. Another temperature mode that we don't think of a lot of time is sunlight conditions for the thermal condition. I was at a plant in Houston, Texas a few years ago, and we were going around taking temperature readings with a temperature gun and a camera, and we realized that in the afternoon the pumps and motors and gearboxes on the outside in direct sunlight would reach temperatures of 160 degrees on the housing, and in the mornings before the sun came up, those, those temperatures would be around 90 to 100. So we built some uh, covers, some galvanized covers, to keep the sunlight off those components to extend our lube life. Sometimes the ambient condition in our plant is going to create this temperature failure mode, and that's a lot of times from process heat. So if we take a basic petroleum lubricant, we can look at this lubricant. It has a 30-year life if we can maintain the lubricant at 70 degrees. Very few of our applications in our operating plants do we have this uh, ability to do this. But if we look at this, every 20 degree rise in the lubricant life, or every 20 degree rise in the lubricant temperature, the life is cut in half. So if we take an example of a lubricating oil in a gearbox run at 170 degrees, you're going to need to replace that every year just due to the lubricant oxidizing. And this is what happens when these lubricants operate at these high temperatures, the petroleum oils start to oxidize. So as soon as we get uh, over the point where, or as soon as we get to the point where they start to oxidize, it's going to uh, create decreased lubricating capacity and increased component wear. So here's a temperature chart, and a lot of these charts I show you today, they're available uh, online. You can send me an email at the end if you'd like to, and I'll send you some of these charts. They also go with the one-day lubrication training. But look, if we look at this at 70 degrees, if our lube will last 30 years. You can see at 90 degrees, it's 15 years, and it goes on down the line. Now, you can look at this as your automobile engine as an example. Your automobile engine runs at anywhere from 190 to 210 degrees. If you start checking your oil visually for when the oil starts turning dark, that's going to happen around three months. And it it's basically follows this curve, and, you, and that's why the oil is oxidizing. So when your oil is dark in your engine, that means the oil is oxidizing. You're not getting the lubricating capability out of that oil as, as, that you had when it was new, and your engine will actually start wearing at a higher rate. Now, these curves are only based on mineral or petroleum-based oils. If you go to synthetic oils, you get three to five times more life out of this, this synthetic products. 
And this curve is only also based on the fact that there's no moisture. Once we add moisture to the equation or other contaminants, the life of this lubricating oil will go down even faster. So with petroleum oils, we can see there's a defined life where the lube will start oxidizing more rapidly based on temperature. Oxidation of petroleum lubes can be delayed with additives. There's a lot of oxidation additives we put in our oils to, uh, to stretch out the time of the lube. You know, it's always going to oxidize. The oxidation cannot be eliminated. So we need to monitor our lube temps uh, and, and use the life charts and change, change our oil based on these temperatures. So what actions can we take for the temperature? We can reduce the temperature with cooling. We can change the lubricant more often so we make sure we have a product in there that's, that's performing the lubrication task. We can sample our lubricant for signs of oxidation. When you sample the lube and you look for your TAN, your total acid number, total base number, when those numbers start changing, your oil is oxidizing. We can improve our understanding of viscosity for equipment applications, make sure we have the right viscosity oil for the application we're using. We have to understand that greases has specific viscosities for the application and having the wrong viscosity is going to cause this temperature failure. And like I said, synthetics are better on temperature failure modes than the petroleum-based lubricants. So then try to eliminate, as you go around your plant, try to eliminate these temperature failure modes and, and reduce, reduce the, the, the rate of oxidation of the oil. Now we get into our next slide here, we're talking about moisture failure modes. How do we have moisture in our oils? Well, I've tested new oils in plants and found new oils in a plant system right in the drums that were delivered that had up to 1% moisture in them. Our, our lubricating oils in our new oil, our new drums and containers coming in should be less than one-tenth of one percent. And then in our equipment, we're going to get this, this moisture. So where does it come from? Ambient conditions, humidity. You know, I did a lot of work in Texas and Louisiana. The high humid days in Texas and Louisiana cause humidity to get in not only the new drums, the new oils, but also in the equipment that's operating. If the equipment that's outside in the rain may have these failures. Wash down practices at food plants. You know, a lot of uh, moisture gets into equipment gearboxes and equipment from wash down practices. So we need to modify those practices or use better seals on the shafts and equipment. If we have equipment that runs hot and then it shuts down and this equipment cools down, when it cools down, we're going to pull in outside ambient moisture, and that's going to add oil or excuse me, add moisture to the oil. Improper seals on equipment, buying better seals or having better seals designed to keep the moisture out and keep the particles out. Additive depletion, you know, as our additive, we have additives in our oil that help with this, uh, you know, with this moisture problem. We need to make sure our additives are maintained. The way we store our lubricants, we're going to look at some storage methods later on in the presentation. But storing our, our drums inside, storing our lubricants in ambient controlled areas is very important to keep the moisture out. Our lube equipment. I've been in plants and saw the lube containers uh, that were taking the lubes around, and I saw those setting out in the plant. I saw them setting out in the weather where they're picking up poor material particles and picking up moisture. <laughs> improper vent, excuse me, improper vent breather device. You know, a lot of a lot of hydraulic units have a little bug screen on them. A lot of gearboxes have a dipstick. Those need to be replaced with a desiccant breather if you have moisture or ambient conditions. Then I see piece people that have put the desiccant breathers on and the, the, the desiccant and the breather is depleted. We need to keep those uh, you know, changed out as need be to keep the moisture from entering our equipment. I've seen a lot of equipment with no vent or breather device, start-stop operations where we heat up and cool down, leaky cooling systems on lubricating systems that are letting moisture in. Dipsticks, you know, one of our practices at Cargill was to replace all the dipsticks with a breather and put sight glasses on our gear. Box, so we didn't have to worry about the entry point with the dipstick. So moisture is present in some form in most areas of the world. It can be controlled, but it must be monitored. Moisture in lubricant increases oxidation, reduces lubricating capability, and rapidly depletes our additives. So let's make sure we run in samples and make sure we know that we're keeping moisture out. We've got to monitor and keep moisture out of our equipment and out of our lube oils. As little as 1% moisture can reduce component life by as much as 50%. So you can see here this small amount of moisture uh, can reduce your component life, such as bearings and gears and your equipment. 2% <clears throat> moisture can reduce your component life by up to 86%. So you can see how important it is to keep moistures out of our lubricants. 
Here's a chart that I put in the uh, presentation. Uh, you can see on the right side if you have these percentages of moistures, and we, we can reduce them to the numbers that, that are out in the middle of the chart. And I'll give you an example if you follow the if you follow the 25,000 part per million line, or let's use the 10,000 part per million line, if we can follow that over and we can reduce our moisture level in our oil to 500 parts per million, you can see that we get six times the life on that equipment component. Now you say, why would anybody have those kind of moisture levels? I was in a plant in Orange, Texas. We looked at the oil analysis results, and they had a gearbox that was failing every eight months. The moisture level in that oil was 40,000 parts per million. If they reduce that down to 500 or 1,000, you can see nine times the life, almost up to 10 times the life with some different methods that we can use. And uh, that, that's what that gearbox should have been lasting at that plant was around nine or 10 years instead of eight, eight months. The additives we talk about can extend the life of the lubricants by controlling oxidation, reducing corrosion, and improving lubricant properties. Additives deplete over time, causing the lubricant to reduce and the wear to increase. Now if we look at the center here as a lubricating oil, these are different kind of additives that can be in your oils. And depending on the oil you buy, like a specific number would be uh, an Exxon Mobil uh, with a number of maybe a 560 or whatever the number might be. That number tells you what additive package is in that oil. So we have to monitor sometimes with testing to make sure we know when our additives are consumed and used up. So you can see we have many different additives here, anti-foam, dispersants, extreme pressure agents or additives, detergents, anti-wear, rust inhibitors, oxidation inhibitors and corrosion inhibitors, and many, many more. So we have to monitor these and, and know when they're used up, which will also cause our oil to oxidize and in the life to shorten. So what are our actions for our moisture failure mode here? Well, we can reduce moisture levels in our new oils you know, by, by working with our supplier and putting in systems to make sure that the moisture is removed when we put it in our storage containers. So we want to eliminate moisture in stored oils. We want to eliminate moisture in our equipment. There, there's equipment on the market today, if you have hydraulic systems or gearboxes that are, that are foaming, the oil's looking foamy, that's a good sign that there's moisture in that oil. You can run uh, dry air through an air dryer across the top of those units. Uh, Donaldson sells a unit that works very effective for that. If you have a nitrogen system in your plant, you can run nitrogen in the airspace of those units and let it vent out and that will take the moisture out. I was at a plant uh, just six months ago where they had 1,000 parts per million in a hydraulic reservoir. We hooked up a, uh, a dry, their dry air, their dry instrument air to that unit and within four hours we had reduced it from 1,000 parts per million to 50 parts per million with just a dry uh, instrument air in the plant. So we ran the air in, vented it off, and the dry air actually absorbed the moisture out of the oil. So many, many ways to do this. So eliminate moisture from our wash down practices, monitor moisture levels and replace lube as needed. So if you have foamy oil and there's no way to get it out of there, you need to replace that oil to extend the life of your equipment components. Use better sealing methods to keep the moisture out. Use desiccant breathers on critical equipment. New devices using dry air to remove the moisture. So there's, there's some new device there. If you need information on those, uh, you can shoot me an email and I'll get you in contact with the right people. Now what about foreign material and particles? You know, these greatly affect the life of our equipment. Well, we'll talk about in a minute here, you know, the, the film thickness between a loaded bearing or a loaded gear is only five microns. I pulled many, many samples from plant oils in the new condition and found 40 and 80 micron particles particles in the new oil. So if you're running these particles through a 5 micron gap, you're just, uh, you're breaking up, you're using your part of the grinder to break up these big boulder particles, and you're causing scratches and wear to your bearings and components that are going to greatly shorten the life of the component. So where do the particles come from? Ambient conditions in your plant. You know, if you're in a fertilizer plant, a foundry, there's a lot of these particles present in the ambient stage. They can be contaminated, they could be in the new oil, like I said. They could be caused by your oil lube practices. I did a survey at a plant. We pulled samples out of the containers the guys were using. The oil in the containers was dirtier than the oil in the storage uh, areas. So the, the, the containers that they were using, which were at that time vinegar jugs and other, other containers, were very, had a lot of particles in them. 
A lot of times the particles are created from the, from the components in our equipment. As they wear, our components generate particles as we break off pieces and small microscopic pieces. Our greasing practices. You know, once we did a calculation, we looked at the top of a greaser. How many 40 micron particles can you put on top of a greaser on the ball or in the little groove around the ball? Well, if you remember, a 40 micron particle is the size of the fine floor dust that's in your house or if you run your hand across the top of a door seal or a window seal, those particles on your finger are 40 micron particles. Well, how many of those would fit around the ball on a greaser? And it's a lot. And every week we pump those into our bearings and components. Improper filtration of our noodle loops, we'll talk about this in a minute. Improper filtration of our process equipment. There's, there's push around portable filters. We can filter the oil in our process equipment if we need to. No filtration practices of the failure mode. Combustion creates uh, these particles in a combustion engine. Improper external vent filtration. You know, one of the reasons we talk about these and the vent breather filters for the desiccant, these filters also filter out particles down to three microns, uh, the, the desiccant breather type filters. So they're a good, a good method of keeping particles out of our equipment. One of the studies I'm going to do here shortly, as soon as we get to all the lab procedures, I'm studying the number of particles of new grease because I found out that grease manufacturers do not filter the oil before they make the greases. So now we're getting buying new greases that have particles in them. So we're putting those right in our equipment. So synthetic greases are much better than the petroleum-based greases when you look at particle counts. Poor lube storage methods and poor lube storage equipment. So for hey. material particles, we must understand that a loaded bearing and gears has only a 5 micron film barrier. Many new lubes have 25 to 40 micron particles present. And like I say, I found 80 and 100 uh, micron particles in new lubes at, at a lot of plant studies. So most plant lubes and operations have millions of particles that are over 5 microns, which is the film thickness for our, our loaded equipment. Hey, Terry, so can we jump in and ask we a talk quick about question? This. Uh, bacteria is 3 microns, so we're talking about particles the size of a red blood cell on our film thickness. So talcum powder would be 10 microns, fine floor dust is 80 microns, a human hair, it, or 40 microns is a fine floor dust, but a human hair is 80 microns. So you can see we're talking about very, very small particles that can cause damage to our equipment components and cause extensive wear. So the component or the particles over 5 microns are, are wearing out the bearings, are wearing out the gears and our equipment components. This next chart I wanted to show you is the ISO cleanliness uh, chart. And there's ISO cleanliness codes for oils in our, in our sampled oils. And what the code tells us, it's a three-digit number. And so we're going to use the example of a 211915. The first number represents the number of 4 micron particles. The second number, the 19, represents the number of particles greater than 6 microns. And the third number is particles greater than 14 microns. Now this ISO code is used when you send your oils in for sample analysis. It tells us how many particles of these different sizes are in the oils. So if we look at our ISO 4406 code here, we can see that our, our oil we were looking at is a 211915. So the 21 tells us there's greater than 10,000 particles of 4 micron, but less than 20,000. Our 19 number tells us that there's greater than 2,500 particles greater than 6 micron, but less than 5,000. Our 15 number, which is our particles greater than 14 microns, which are the particles that are causing excessive damage and wear to our components, is greater than 160 and less than 320. But you can see here, this is the number of particles in a one milliliter sample. So if you have a five gallon reservoir and you're getting these kind of numbers, you can see the particle counts of these different sizes going to the millions and billions. And if you've ever noticed from an oil analysis uh, result, if you look at the numbers, if you've ever wondered why the particles less than 4 microns go up to the 25,000 parts and 40,000 particles, the reason that happens is because you're grinding all your big particles up into these small particles. So you'll always see in an oil analysis result, you'll always see the 4 micron particle counts increase to very, very high numbers. This is a chart here for gearbox life extension. You can see our ISO cleanliness codes on the side. If we look at the area here on the chart in this 22-23 range or maybe the 22-21 range here on the side, 
as I do samples at plants, these are a lot of the numbers. This is the area that I find the isocleanliness codes in, in a lot of plant equipment, in a lot of the stored oils, and a lot of the containers. So you can see here, if we're looking at these numbers, and we clean our oil up to this area over here, which would be a 10 micron absolute filtration, you can see we're going to add three, two and a half to three times to the life of this gearbox. Now I've got some charts here for bearings and other equipment, journal bearings and things like that. Some of these numbers in our bearings, our journal bearings and our regular roller bearings go up to six and seven and eight times the life on the, on the individual bearing components. So if anybody's interested in some of those charts, let me know and we can have those supplied. So for a material, material, how do we keep it out? We must develop procedures to eliminate particles from all of our lubricants. We want to filter our new oils because they have particles in them. We want to keep our loops clean before we use them in the equipment. We want to keep the loops clean in the equipment. So as we pull samples and we see these loops getting dirty, we've got our filter carts and different methods that we can use to filter the particles out. We want to buy grease products that have been produced from filtered oil or, or changed to synthetics. Now there are a couple companies that are doing some filtration of the oil before they make the grease. Uh, Lubriplate is one of those companies. Uh, Lubrication Engineers is telling me that they filter the oil before they make the grease. None of them are giving up what numbers they're using, but the actual process that they're actually filtering the oil is key. A company in Canada called Petro uh, Canada actually filters the oil before they make their lubes. So viscosity, what causes viscosity failure modes of our lube? Well, we talked about temperature. If we have high temperatures, the viscosity of the lube is going to change, and that could affect the wear of your components. Uh, lube procedures, if we're mixing lubes, if we're uh, not doing a good job of keeping our containers separated, we can change the lube viscosity. Uh, mixing during storage and receiving can change the viscosity. As our lubes oxidize, the viscosity will change. As we get contamination into our lubricating products, the viscosity can change. Moisture definitely changes. Moisture or any other chemicals we get mixed with our lube is definitely going to change the viscosity. And lack of proper additives. If the additive package is wrong or the additive package is, is depleted, it can change the viscosity of our oils. Now, I put down here at the bottom no additives, and there's been some studies done by Noria that we've, where we found in a couple of the uh, samples that I've done where additive packages were never added to the oil even though they were supposed to be in there. And Noria, I listened to a presentation of theirs in Columbus this year, and they've actually tested two drums of oil that were delivered to plants that were all additives and no oil. So you can see what that's going to do to failures in, in component life if the oil has more additives than it is oil. So a lot of none, some more reasons why you should be checking your new oils. So viscosity must be understood and controlled for every application. Viscosity determines how the lube will flow through the components of the equipment, and this is also true for our grease and oil. Now, a, a short example of that one would be a hydraulic system that was designed for a specific purpose. Uh, maybe the OEM recommended a viscosity of uh, 120, but when the, when the application is put in, if the oil is running hotter than that during the application, that viscosity may go down around 100, and you're not going to get the good sealing in the hydraulic motor, the hydraulic pump, and you may have leaking around your uh, piston and, and other uh, devices in the system. So we should check the viscosity at the operating temperature. I put this little chart in here. We won't spend a lot of time on this, but this is how viscosity is determined. Uh, that that information is in there, and if anybody, we can get this off of the uh, off the internet too. So I won't, I won't spend any time on these two slides. They're just basically general information on, on viscosity. Grease viscosity, like I said, I'm amazed at the number of plants I visit. And during the loop training, people don't understand that greases have different viscosities. People aren't taking the time to go get the right grease gun for the, for the low speed bearing or the high speed bearing. And we're just causing more failures and shorten the life of our equipment when we do things like that. So, Contamination. Where does contamination come? Well, environmental conditions can contaminate our oils. Leaky coils from cooling systems. I ran into this at a Hyundai plant in Korea. They were having problems with their, with some of their oil products, and they had cooling coils in a lot of the equipment around the ovens. And those coils were actually leaking into the lube, and causing some very, very short life of their, some of their equipment. Lube practices. Uh, the lube storage area can cause problems with contamination. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Your lube application equipment. You know the containers, the grease guns. Your lube transport equipment. 
your lube vendor. You know, I've been to a number of uh, facilities when we do the lube training. We go and talk to the lube vendor, the guy that's actually filling the drums for your Exxon Mobiles and other vendors. And some of the conditions they have at those drum filling filling facilities are causing contamination of our lube products. And then, of course, our lube uh, equipment procedure, the procedure we have in place, can cause contamination of our lubes. And one of the ways we control here, you see 10 pumps. Oh, you there you are. 10, back. Dual, 10 micron beta 1000 filters. So every one of their 10 lubricants is filtered through a, a dual uh, 10 micron beta 1000 filter. So they have very, very clean uh, lubricants in their 10 storage containers. The maintenance people can go into the room and get whatever lubricant they, they want. You can see that the lubricant uh, containers have desiccant breathers on board. Uh, there's a garage roll-up door you can see there on the top. It's rolled up now. They can bring their barrels in. Uh, and, and warm them up during the winter before they pump them in. There's heaters. It's heated. It's air conditioned. It's lighted. It's got a sprinkling system. So very, very nice storage room for lubricants here. This in here is one that's in a food plant at J.M. Smucker's plant in Memphis, Tennessee. This lube room is mounted right in the plant. Uh, the maintenance people go inside. You can see it. it's air conditioned. It's not heated since it's inside, but very, very nice installation here. Uh, they put their barrels down at the other end, and there's a hose outside where they don't have to take their barrels in. They pump the barrels into their containers. This is what it looks like inside the room. You can see they're using oil-safe containers. Uh, I, I, we did a, a lubrication excellence training program there. You can see they followed my advice. They're going to have to use funnels. They use funnels that are able to seal on the top and bottom. They have different containers they store their grease in and different storage cabinets. Here's their pump and filtrate system. They actually have a water filter and a 10 micron. In fact, I think this plant is actually went down to 3 micron beta 1000. They wanted all the particles out of their lube. So very, very good uh, system here. This is some of the drawings you get with the lube rooms. You can see here it, it shows the containers you're going to have in there, how much space the maintenance person has, the sprinkler line. Uh, there's a stainless steel workbench in here to work with, so different options they can have in the room. What's wrong with that? So we always want to look at ways to control lubricant contamination of your plant. Find out where, the, if you have contamination, you have particles, find out where they're coming from and try to eliminate those. So check all your new loops for contaminants. <clears throat> Filter all your new loops into containers. Store the lubricants in a controlled environment. As you're taking the lubricants around the plant, there's a number of vendors that make these oil-safe type containers. Uh, I can, oil-safe. Oil a number of them, so use those kind of containers. The containers are sealed from particles, sealed from from moisture, much better than, than the vinegar jugs and the Tide jugs and things like that. You know, if you have problems getting the components or getting material into your equipment or poor material, you know, try the Labra seals out uh, over the Chicago Rawhide seal. This, this also helps in the food plant where you're getting water contamination if you use a Labra seal on the equipment. You can filter your contaminants out with online filters that are available to filter carts and get, keep your contaminants down to very, very low levels for longer equipment life. And of course, get training on contamination eliminated. That's one of the services we offer, teaching people how to do this and teaching you on the importance of it. Synthetic lubricants outperform mineral-based petroleum products in just every situation. They have higher thermal oxidation stability, so that means they'll last longer under the high temperatures, uh, most of the time three to five times longer. Lower pore points for the cold weather climates, lower volatility, less foaming characteristics. And one of the reasons for this is synthetic oils are less susceptible to mixing with moisture in the process. So you don't get the foaming. The, the water will actually separate a lot better. Still, we need to keep the moisture out, but synthetic lubes is a better alternative. Longer lube and equipment life. And, you know, of course, hydrolysis is the process I was talking about where, our, where the water mixes with our lubricants. So overall, synthetic lubricants uh, outperform the petroleum-based lubricants in every category. Operational failure modes. These are the failure modes of the operation, which could be operators, maintenance, but you know, low oil levels on equipment and, and, and not monitoring those conditions. A sudden volume loss in our equipment. Overfilling, too much oil in equipment. If you take the example of a centrifugal pump, you know, if, they're, if it's filled over halfway up the bearings, you're generating more heat because there's too much oil in the bearing. The oil should be right at the very bottom edge of the balls. Most pump manufacturers tell you that to keep it halfway up the ball, but the ideal area is right at the bottom. So if, if there's a way to do that and a way to check the oil and keep the oil level prop, 
for you can you can add your equipment life by controlling the uh, temperature failure mode. I sell a grease uh, manual that has this compatibility chart in it that'll help you out. Unmonitored degradation. We see our oils getting dark. We see our oils foaming. We see particles. Of course, most of the particles you can't see. But you know, if we see these things, we're not monitoring those things. We're going to shorten our equipment life. Contamination from fuel and chemicals. Additive depletion in our in our lubes are the wrong additives. Under and over greasing are operational type failure modes. Non food grade or food grade lube sometimes can be failure modes. In our wash down practice, these are all things that can be controlled with, with proper monitoring of the equipment, proper PM procedures, and proper TPM if we can have operators monitor some of these conditions a little more closely. closely. So these are the failure modes uh, only directly related to the lubricants. So you can see there's a lot of things you can look at here. And you know, people uh, that are listening, if they want a copy of these, these failure modes, I can send you that in a PDF where you can go out in your plant, but a lot of these I hope you take a notes. Uh, they're very, very easy. Most of them are very, very easy to eliminate. They're very, very easy to control, but you have to have a program in place to do that. So now if we look at program failures, and one of the biggest program failures of lubrication excellence is no program. You know, people haven't looked at this as an important thing. We have PM procedures, we have lubing procedures, but a lubrication excellence program is key in extending the life of our equipment. Incomplete program, no documentation. You know, there's there's no procedure written up for how to order, how to receive, and how to store oils. There's no RCM decision process used on how often things should be lubed. You know, a lot of times we've been lubing a bearing, and I'll give you an example from the plant that I operated in the 70s and early 80s. Our our method of lubing bearings, if it was a four-inch bearing, we gave it four shots a week. If it was a three-inch bearing, we gave it three shots a week. Well, that plant has come a long way since. And then we've looked at decision processes such as how fast is it turning, how much load is it under, how many hours of day does it actually run. And then, of course, we also use the UE equipment, the grease caddy, and that helped us determine grease volumes and grease frequencies. So that, that's something that UE sells that many people don't know about, many people don't use, but it was a great help for our plant to determine what the frequency should be and what the volume of the loop should be on each loop cycle. Improper sampling procedures is another program uh, failure. If you're not sampling your oils, knowing when your additives are gone, knowing if we have moisture, knowing if we have particles, you're going to have shortened equipment life. So no analysis, oil analysis program. Now, wear particle analysis is a different process than oil analysis. In wear particle analysis, we're asking the lab to tell us what are the particles. Oil analysis tells us that we have these particles, but sometimes we want to know what they are. Is it dirt from our process? Is it dirt from the neighbor's process? is it actual particles that are coming off your components such as bearings and gears. Improper no online filtration, these are filtration systems that we put on that run continuously, and improper offline filtration systems where we come around we filter equipment with the filter carts. Improper equipment oil drain procedures, and this is a pointer I'll give you when you're draining oil or you're changing oil in your car or a gearbox or a hydraulic unit, if you leave as little as 10 percent of the old oil in the system, as soon as you put the new oil in, 50% of the additives are going to be consumed because of the old oil left in. So we need to drain all the oil out and make sure we flush all the oil out. Additive package depletion, not monitoring that. The wrong additive package for the application is another program failure. Here's some more program failures. No lubricate, lubrication audit. You know, I do these lubrication audits to let people know where they're failing in their lubrication programs and how they can improve the program. Lubrication excellence training, it can be a four, eight hour training course which lets your maintenance level people know about all the things we talked about here today and how to eliminate those failures. No best, best practice loop storage rooms. No loop consolidation program. You know, many plants I go into, they're using 20 or 30 different loops. Those many times can be consolidated down to as many as four to 10 different loops and you reduce the chance of failure and the chance of uh, contamination. Not following oil analysis reports. If you're going to do oil analysis, make sure you look at the reports and follow the processes, follow the things that you see as failures. No training for the people doing the work. No written lubrication program. No ultrasonic lubrication equipment such as the UE grease caddy. Great, great tool. If you've not tried this or looked at this, you need to, you need to call UE about this tool. No automatic lubricators. One of the things we found out using the grease caddy, the UE grease caddy, was we determined, once we determined our volume 
in our frequencies, frequencies of the lube, we started using automatic lubricators because we knew what, how much lube the bearing needed at that point. But the only way we found out that volume and frequency was with the UE grease caddy. Not using synthetic lubricants, and there's some applications that are high temp applications that should be synthetic lube applications. All applications may not be uh, required to have synthetic lube, but many, many applications in your plant uh, should be. No filtration training understanding what size filter to buy and why to buy that, that particular filter. And no moisture reduction program. You know, a lot of our failures in our lubes are moisture. So without a program to, uh, to look at these things, you know, we're not going to be able to eliminate these failures. So in wrapping up here, you know, consider performing lubrication excellence training and learn the correct methods to properly eliminate each of the 50 failure modes. The training can extend your equipment life three to eight times. So you can see there's a huge payback you know, when I talk to people in Cargill, when we used to get, uh, there was, we had a couple particular bearings we got 18 months out of uh, with our old loop practices. And now they're getting five or six years out of some of those components. And many, many more stories in the, uh, in the industry around those, those types of increases in, in component life. So you can see here, if we go back to our PF curve, if you're operating this reactive area, if we're fixing, repairing things based on what people are telling us, you know, start doing some predictive technologies. If you're not using UE yet, a great, great tool. There's more failure modes for the price for the cost of that equipment than any other uh, predictive technology, but also oil analysis, wear particle analysis, and some of these other technologies are very important to increase your uh, effectiveness and maintenance. And then moving over here, having some of your resources. The reason these arrows go back to the left is having some of your resources move over and start doing some things in the proactive area, lubrication excellence, precision alignment, precision balance. And I'll give you one more pointer while I've got you on the call here since we have a few minutes. But, you know, a lot of times when with precision balance, we assume that if we buy a brand new pump or a brand new motor that it's precision balanced. Well, they're balanced to an ANSI standard of 0.08 to 0.12 inches per second. That goes for motors and pumps. If you ask a pump company to to balance your impeller to 0 0.05 inches per second, and then we do a good job of precision alignment with a laser or a reverse style indicator, you know, we're talking about extending those component lives, those bearing lives, to three to five times. So that wraps up my presentation, Doug. If there's any questions we can do, or they, I have my email address on there. If people want to email me for more information or, or, or anything, they can do that. Terry, we had a, we had a couple questions for you here. Uh, I had the very first one we had back a while. Was what do you think of varnish as a failure mode? Well, varnish is a big failure mode, and there, and we can we can we can reduce varnish by understanding the temperature modes. But and there's some additives that help out in varnish. Uh, but yeah, there there's some different things we can do to eliminate varnish. But varnish is a is a failure mode, and it's basically due to temperature. We're actually uh, uh, oxidizing and baking that oil right on the components. I see. There, oh, we had another one here. Is what is the source? It was early on in here. What was the source of the temp versus lube life info that you presented? The source of that was a study that was done by uh, Paul and also done by the uh, uh, University of Oklahoma State University. Okay. The we uh, another one we had was how long are these additives in these lubricants supposed to last? Well, that 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 de totally depends on the operating conditions of the of the equipment, the operating conditions of the oil. But one of the things we found out as the temperature goes up on the oil, the additive package, uh, whatever's in the additive package is going to deplete if it's an oxidation uh, inhibitor. If if it's a uh, if it's a rust inhibitor, a corrosion inhibitor, it's going to be used up based on the moisture that we have in the oil. So there's many many reasons why your additive packages are used up and, and depleted. We had a one in here and how uh, using dry air to remove moisture in applications. Was that a temporary measure or was that um, a more permanent solution? Well, in, in the application where I told you about the gearbox that had 40,000 parts per million of moisture, we actually put a permanent uh, air dryer on that gearbox that constantly bled uh, instrument type dry air through the, through the top of the airspace of that box. Now, some plants are buying, Donaldson sells a small air dryer called the dry pack, and you can take actually take this around your different hydraulic units or your different gearboxes in your plant and put the unit on there for two to four hours to lower your moisture levels down to uh, below 100 parts per million. 
Gotcha. Uh, somebody asked if we remove some of these additives when we do filtration. No, as long as we don't go uh, down below three microns, we, you can filter all the way down to three microns and not remove any additives. The only thing you have to remember there is when you're down at three microns, your additives are going to start, some of your additives are going to start grabbing particles that are in the system. And if, if those particles are clinging to the additive, uh, sometimes the additive will cling to the filter, but that's, that's usually, usually below three microns absolute which I don't recommend going to uh, in the first part of your uh, lubrication excellence program. You can, you can go down to 10 microns absolute with a beta 1000 and greatly extend your equipment life. Well, thank you, uh, Terry. We have a bunch more questions that kind of came in here. And what I thought I might do is we'll ship those to you if you okay. want to actually respond. Some of these are quite detailed in nature. Okay, um, sure. But that was, that's tremendous. I think lubrication is a great big issue for a lot of people. We find we hear about it all the time at UE Systems. We had some questions here come in on the ultrasound specific, and we'll get to addressing those. But on, on those, uh, that lube, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a cart or that whole building there, was that one of them that you make? Yeah, that's, that's, that's something my company started making about a year ago when I was doing this training. People were going out and saying, well, I need to build a nice storage area. So I started asking people to tell me how much it was going to cost to build a loop storage area in their plant. And a lot of them came back in the thirty-five dollars to $50,000 range to build a climate control room. I started building these rooms in shipping containers uh, about a year ago. And I can build a 20-foot container for about $20,000 and in a 40-foot a container for about twenty-five dollars to $30,000, depending on how many containers, how many filters, and all the options they want. But it's it, it makes it nice because it comes to the facility, everything's in there, all you have to do is plug it in and start using it that day. So, Ah, gotcha. Well, perfect. Thank you um, uh, for taking all your time. We'll get you to do a couple more topics on some other things on lubrication here in the future. It's always extremely interesting, at least for me and I believe for our audience too, just based on the number of people we had signed up and tune in for this thing. To find out more about UE Systems, please use the contact information above.